Hey friends, Ms. K here. Today we're going to be reading The Earth Dragon Awakes, The San Francisco Earthquake of 1906 by Lawrence Yep. We will be reading pages 1 through 16. On this page, the author gives us a little note in the beginning. The characters are imaginary. However, the events in the novel are based on fact. I could not have made up so many grand and terrible things. Early evening, Tuesday, April 17, 1906, San Francisco. It is early evening in San Francisco. Streetlights come on. People hurry home. No one knows about the danger below. Underneath their feet, the earth begins to stir. At that moment, the Travis family is too busy to worry. Henry's parents are going to the opera. Henry's mother calls from upstairs. Ah, sing, have you seen my silk shawl? Mr. Travis bellows. Ah, sing, I need a new shirt. You've shrunk another one. Mrs. Travis pats her husband's belly affectionately. Don't blame Ah Sing, dear. It's time for a diet. I'm not fat, Mr. Travis protests. My stomach is as solid as the earth. His belly shows through the open hole on his shirt. It jiggles when he moves. It's all Ah Sing's fault. He does something to my shirts, and that's why I keep losing buttons. Don't change shirts, dear, Mrs. Travis says. We don't have time. Mr. Caruso will be so disappointed if you show up late for his Don Jose. I would rather go to the roller skating carnival, Mr. Travis grumbles. They're giving out a thousand dollar prize for the best costume. I wish we could go roller skating too, says Henry. He was eager to try out his new skates. He'd gotten them for Easter two days before. We'll have a picnic next Sunday, Mrs. Travis suggests. Enrico Caruso should be grateful if I don't go tonight, Mr. Travis yawns. I'm so tired from work, I'll just nap there. Even his bellowing won't keep me awake. If his singing doesn't, my elbow will, teases Mrs. Travis. I had Ah Sing sharpen it today. She jabs him in the side. Mr. Travis rubs his ribs. That's why I need padding there. Maybe I could go to the skating carnival with Ah Sing, Henry says hopefully. I know you're dying to try your new skates, his mother says, but the carnival's not for children. Ah Sing and his son, Chin, come upstairs. Ah Sing is tra the Travis's houseboy. He cleans and cooks and helps around the house. Chin has the cloak. Ah Sing has the sewing basket. Henry, help Ah Sing find the button, Mr. Travis orders. Ah Sing has helped Mr. Travis get ready many times. I got plenty, Ah Sing says. I sweep, I find, I keep. From his pocket, he takes out a matching button. On his coat, he has stuck a needle with thread. It is the right color. Ah Sing is like the captain of a ship in a storm. He tells Henry and Chin to hold Mr. Travis's shirt closed while he sews the button on. Henry winks at Chin. Chin is nine and Henry is eight. They have become good friends. Though Chin has been in America for only two years, he already speaks English better than his father. Suddenly, Henry's pet dog, Sawyer, begins to howl. Mr. Travis scrunches up his face. You should take Sawyer. He can sing with Caruso. He's been doing that all day. I don't know what's wrong with him. We took him to the vet, Mrs. Travis says. He's perfectly healthy. Henry puts his dog in his room. Then he returns to help his parents some more. He fetches his mother's beaded purse. His father misplaces his top hat twice. Both times, Henry finds it. Ah Sing, Chin, and Henry manage to steer them to the front door. Mrs. Travis stops on the threshold. She picks an umbrella that matches her gown. There isn't a rain cloud in the sky, protests Mr. Travis. You never know when an umbrella will come in handy, his wife says calmly. By the doorway, they have not one, but two umbrella stands. They are filled with umbrellas. You have too many choices, Mr. Travis teases. If your collection were smaller, 
it wouldn't take so long to pick one. If you didn't lose them, I wouldn't need so many, Mrs. Travis says. She finally selects two. Somehow, Ah Sing, Chin, and Henry get them on their way. Ah Sing begins to pick up the discarded shawls, capes, and cloaks from the floor. He tells the boys to do their schoolwork. Henry is on Easter vacation, but he has homework. Chin does not attend American school yet, but he hopes to go soon. At the moment, he goes to Chinese school in Chinatown. Because Chinese school does not celebrate Easter, he would normally have gone tonight. However, the Travises had asked Ah Sing and Chin to watch Henry. Sawyer crouches in a corner of Henry's bedroom. He is terrified. Henry makes a place for Sawyer on his bed. Then, looking out the window, Henry begins his art assignment. He has to draw his neighborhood. Chin lies on the floor and starts his essay about his home in China. He has almost too much to write. The Americans make it difficult for a Chinese man to bring his family to America. It has been hard enough for just Chin to come. He had to study for months and months before he got on the boat to America. He needed to know everything. He had to memorize every house in his village, every field, every window, every tree, every animal. The immigration officials spent a week asking him questions. If he had made a mistake, they would have assumed he was lying. They would have sent him back to China. They would have sent his father back too. Chin would have liked to go home, but his father's salary is very important. An American dollar is worth so much more in China. Chin's father can support his mother, his grandparents, and several other relatives. Henry finishes his picture quickly. The wooden houses press against one another. They are all three stories high. The front doors are all one story from the ground. The houses all have bay windows. Except for the paint, they all look the same. Sawyer whimpers. Henry tries to pet him. He can feel his dog shivering. What spooked you, boy? He does not want to move and disturb Sawyer more. So he tells Chin to open his school bag and get his present. Chin makes sure Ah Sing is downstairs. Then he sneaks a flimsy paper book from his school bag. On the cover, a cowboy blazes away with a six gun as another cowboy falls to the dust. The whole day, Chin has been looking forward to this. None of their parents approve of the cheat books. Henry's mother even calls them Penny Dreadfuls. All the boys at Henry's school like them and pass them around. Henry has been helping Chin learn English by reading the Dreadfuls with him. When I grow up, I'm going to be a lawman just like Marshall Earp. Henry pretends to blaze away with his six shooters. I'm never going to be like my father. All he does is add up numbers all day in that old bank. And my father washes dishes, Chin sighs. Neither is exciting, Henry agrees. Sawyer lifts his head and begins to howl again. As he tries to calm his dog again, Henry wishes he knew what was upsetting him. Everything else seems so peaceful and boring, just like his parents. Henry is puzzled, but he promises, Don't worry, boy. I won't let anything happen to you. Late evening, Tuesday, April 17, 1906, deep beneath San Francisco. Mr. Travis is wrong. The earth is not solid. Deep in the center of the earth, it is very hot. It is so hot that even rock melts. To us, the land and ocean seem huge, but they are only the surface of our world. Compared to the earth's core, the surface is very thin. It floats on the hot core like a pie crust. The surface itself is broken into pieces called plates. Each bit of land and sea is on some plate. Tall mountains and deep sea floors, people, animals, fish and forests are all on top of these plates. San Francisco is on the edge of the North American plate. 
Next to it is the Pacific Plate, which holds the Pacific Ocean. The Pacific Plate moves two inches to the northwest every year. That seems slow to us. Your fingernails grow that much in 12 months. The two plates shove each other like two wrestlers. The place where they meet is called the San Andreas Fault. It stretches for 650 miles from the southwest to the northwest and reaches 10 miles wide in some places. Many other smaller cracks branch from it like twigs from a tree. The two plates bump and grind against each other all the time. Usually, no one feels it, but sometimes they shove very hard. We call those earthquakes. Over the years, the earth has moved many times under San Francisco, but it has been 38 years since the last strong earthquake. People have forgotten how bad they can be but they will soon remember. Midnight, Wednesday, April 18th, 1906, Chinatown. Chin and Henry are supposed to sleep. Instead, they read by the light of the street lamps. They are still reading when Henry's parents come home. Mr. Travis has managed to lose yet another umbrella. Mrs. Travis gives Chin a piece of candy before he leaves the house. Don't let Mr. Travis know I gave this to you, she says with a wink, or he'll turn the house upside down to find my secret hoard. Ah Sing and Chin leave the Travis house. As they wait for the cable car, Chin eats Mrs. Travis's candy. He thinks about his own mother. Do you think mother misses us? He asks his father. Every day, his father says. Chin will have to spend most of his life here like his father. Will Chin forget his mother after a while? Do you miss mother? He asks his father. Every day, his father says. It seems forever before the cable car comes. Chin can feel the book hidden under his shirt. He can't wait to get back to it. When he reads, he forgets his boredom. He forgets his loneliness. When the cable car finally arrives, sleepy Chinese climb down. Like Ah Sing and Chin, they work in the houses. They also live in them. But tonight, on their night off, they have gone into Chinatown. Ah Sing and Chin could have stayed with the Travises too. But Ah Sing insists they live in Chinatown. He doesn't want Chin to forget he's Chinese. Their fellow houseboys fuss over Chin. He reminds them of the children they left behind in China. He usually welcomes the attention. Tonight, though, he is impatient. He wants to read more of his new book. He climbs quickly onto the cable car. The crew greets him. They are friends with their Chinese passengers. They even wear silver pins of a dragon. The jewelry is a gift from the houseboys. The car lurches forward. The cable rattles and hums in its bed beneath the rails. Like a long metal snake, it wiggles along its track. The grip man hooks the cable car onto it. The cable car hitches a ride on the moving cable. Silvery tracks lead up and down the hills. On the crest, Chin sees San Francisco spread out before them. Street lamps glitter like jewels. American houses perch shoulder to shoulder like pigeons. Beyond them rise the tall buildings of the business district. Some of them tower so high that people say they scrape the sky. They call them skyscrapers. Chin usually enjoys the view. Tonight, he only wants the cable car to go faster. Chin and his father say goodbye to the cable car crew and get off in Chinatown. It is so much bigger than his village in China. There are around 10,000 Chinese who live here but not all of them speak the same dialect as he does. Though they come from China, he cannot always understand them. So it is home and yet not home to Chin. Even the buildings are different. They are all so much taller than the ones in his village. 
Some are three or even four stories high. A few look like the Chinese ones Chin saw in Hong Kong before he got on the ship to come here. Most are American buildings. They look so plain compared to the ones at home. There are no tiled roofs or carved windows. But the Chinese have added signs and decorations to them. The American buildings look like they are wearing Chinese disguises. Though it is late, Chinatown is still very busy. Chinese shop in the stores. They eat in the restaurants. Americans dine with them. Some are ladies in evening dress and gentlemen in top hats. Some are in costume with roller skates draped over their chairs. They have been to the carnival. Chin can't wait to get back to their room, but his father drags him all over Chinatown on dull errands. He picks up a couple of Chinese newspapers. Then he buys a bag of apples for the Travises. Mrs. Travis hopes she can get Mr. Travis to eat them instead of cake. Chin has his doubts about that. Everywhere they go, Ah Sing bumps into friends. He always stops to chat. Chin follows his father impatiently. Finally, they return to their tenement. As they pass the little temple, their neighbor, Ah Kwan, comes out. He dodges around a wagon and crosses the street to them. Chin groans silently. Ah Kwan means another delay. Worse, he always stinks of blood from his work in the butcher shop. Many people avoid him because of that. He goes to the temple every night. He says he needs all the help he can get. Next to the priests, he prays more than anyone in Chinatown. Tonight though, he has been asking heaven to keep the earth dragon quiet. The animals in his shop have been frightened. If I were a chicken and saw your knife, I'd be scared too, Ah Sing says. But not this way, they're terrified. Ah Kwan says, at home, animals know when there's going to be an earthquake. He scratches his head. I can't blame the earth dragon if he gets upset. There are all these people stomping on his ceiling. He begins to tiptoe. The earth dragon has shaken the city before. Ah Sing laughs. We're still holding on to his back. Like fleas on a dog. Ah Quinn grins nervously. But what if he gets really mad? Ah Sing does not take Ah Kwan's fears seriously. He slapped his friend on the back. We've been through lots of earthquakes here. If you're still alive, you pick up and go on. Chin thinks about Henry's dog, Sawyer. Silently, he asks the earth dragon to keep his temper. Together with Ah Kwan, they climb the tenement stairs. When Chin had first seen the tenement, he had thought it was a hollow hill full of caves. It didn't seem very Chinese either. As they mount the steep steps, Chin hears the clacking of mahjong tiles. In that game, players match pieces. Someone is playing the scales on a fiddle. Other people are arguing. Another person is crying. Still another is laughing. It is a small village in itself. Sometimes Chin wishes they didn't live on the top floor. It is very tiring to walk up three flights after a long day. In their room, his father takes an empty box from a neatly stacked column of boxes. You might as well put your book in here. I already have a box for my school, work, school books, Chin says. I mean the one that Mr. Henry gives you, Ah Sing sighs. Embarrassed, Chin puts the book into the box. You knew? I can feel your library. Ah Sing rubs his back. I think I still have dents there. He holds up the mattress. Quickly, Chin picks up the books beneath it and places them inside the box. You can read them as long as you get good report cards, his father warns. I will, Chin promises. He pulls out a book. May I read one chapter? His father sighs. It's better than having you sneak outside. You know I've been reading on the stairs? Chin asks guiltily. His father smiles. 
I'm interested in everything you do. It just may not seem like it because I'm usually busy. Chin snuggles up in bed. Soon, he loses himself in Marshall Herb's adventures. His father is kind and he works hard, but he is no hero. No one wants to read about peeling potatoes and washing dishes.